Тогда я позволю себе представить э, профессора Майкла Дэвида Фокса по-русски. Э, он русским языком еще владеет не хуже нас с вами, но да. будет сегодня, э, тем не менее, выступать по-английски, что, я думаю, мы ему э, простим. Значит, э, профессор э, Дэвид Фокс, Майкл Дэвид Фокс, это профессор э, Джорджтаунского университета, э, School of Foreign Service, э, что-то аналог нашей дипломатической академии, я бы сказал так, кузница кадров Госдепа. И ну, исторического, значит, ну, многие известные дипломаты заканчивают этот факультет, и одновременно профессор факультета истории э, Дружеского университета, в настоящее время к тому же исполняет обязанности директора Центра российских э, и, и восточноевропейских и евроазиатских исследований. Так теперь называется бывший Советский Союз. А, так, э, и э, профессор Дэвид Фокс, самое главное, это научный руководитель Международного центра истории и социологии Второй мировой войны Высшей школы экономики 2014 года. А, Майкл, э, как это и принято у приличных людей, получил BA в Принстоне, PhD в Еле, э, по э, Russian Studies и по э, истории. И его первая книга, я думаю, что именно это в конечном счете или в начальном счете привело к его, его выступлению здесь, заявленной темой, это вот такая книжка «Revolution of the Mind, High Revenant Among the Bolsheviks». Вот я передаю эту книгу, и поскольку люди здесь все интеллигентные, то я, значит, в всякий случай хочу сказать, что неплохо было бы ее вернуть впоследствии. А, профессор э, Дэвид Фокс преподавал в университете Мэриленда в колледж парке э, много лет, где э, был директором Центра российских исследований. А, и э, главное э, приключение его жизни в этот период, приключение в кавычках, это то, что он вместе с э, Питером Холквистом и Маршалом По основал журнал «Критика». Критика «Explorations in Russian and Eurasian History». Ну, так получилось, что мне пришлось участвовать в 2000 году в одном из первых, сегодня самом первом, в обшоке критики. Еще, еще не вышел ни один номер в э, колледж-парке в университете Мэриленда. И когда я узнал, что они основывают журнал, э, в тот период, когда сокращается финансирование Russian Studies, э, когда существуют такие монстры, как Slavic Review и Russian Review, то есть Хуже времени э, придумать было невозможно. Я подумал, что ребята хорошие, но немножко сумасшедшие. И идея совершенно безумная. Она оказалась настолько безумной, что блестяще сработала. И критика э, просто ворвалась мгновенно в число лучших журналов и просто стала лучше. Это в настоящее время бесспорно лучший э, журнал по э, истории э, России и Евразии. Вот, и как обосновался в первом квартире, известные нам характеристики так, оттуда никогда и не выходит. А, Майкл а, за вот, свою а, работу в качестве главного редактора он ушел в отставку после 10 лет, будучи а, одним из а, редакторов, а, удостоен а, приза а, для заслуженных, значит, вот, а, скажу это по-английски, -по 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 Distinguished Editor Award from the Council of Editors of Learned Journals. То есть вот приз заслуженному редактору от Ассоциации американских изданий. Добавлю, что вторая книга профессора Дэвида Фокса «Show Custom the Great Experiment – Cultural Diplomacy and Western Visitors to Soviet Russia 1921-1941» вышла относительно недавно в Оксфорде в 2011 году. Она вышла в переводе на русский язык под названием «Витрины великого эксперимента». Советская культурная дипломатия и ее западные гости в 2014 году, и что э, более существенно э, выходит на китайском в 2016 году в Китае. Ну, если 1% китайцев купит в книги, то я думаю, что остаток жизни можно провести на Гавайях или, по крайней мере, в Афоне. Вот, чего я искренне тебе и желаю. Добавлю, что кроме того, о чем я говорил, Майкл Дэвид Фокс был Гумбольдовский Хумбл Феллоу в Берлин, 
Wilkin Professor of uh, School of Social Sciences in Paris, uh, Davis Fellow at Princeton, uh, Fellow of the Swedish Collegium for Advanced Study uh, in the Social Sciences in Uppsala, Research Scholar at the Kennan Institute for Advanced Russian Studies, and Fellow at the Mandel Center for Advanced Holocaust Studies in the United States Memorial Holocaust Museum. Кроме того, Майкл редактор, ответственный редактор восьми сборников статей, которые выходили в различных издательствах, посвященных тем или иным проблемам истории России 20-го столетия. Ну, после чего я... После этого я даже не знаю, что сказать, но ну, Олег очень уважаемый коллега, но я должен поправить одну вещь. Две вещи. Во-первых, я говорю по-русски не лучше вас. А во-вторых, но хуже на самом деле. А во-вторых, я работаю Джорджтаунский университет, это иезуитский университет. И School of Foreign Service, где я работаю, школа международных отношений, учреждили в 2019 году. Foreign Service – это буквально можно переводить как школа иностранной службы. И иезуиты имели это в буквальном смысле, чтобы служить у иностранных народов. Как бы. И у Гостдепартамента они 10 лет спустя создали Institute of Foreign Service. И все путают друг друга. И на самом деле мы не только готовят дипломатов, хотя Билл Клинтон был один из наших выпускников. И если Хиллари будет президентом, то, может быть, будут какие-то, я не знаю, выгоды. Но я извиняюсь, что я готовил доклад на английском языке. Это было слишком сложно на русском, но если будут вопросы потом или комментарии, я буду рад пытаться по-русски ответить. Так что перейду на, на английский. So, I would like to begin with um, a personal story, which has some bearing on my topic. And when I first arrived in Moscow, I was a graduate student, a second year student from Yale University. And the, the Soviet Union still existed. This was 1989. And I was living in MGU, in Zona V, where all the foreigners lived. And like any good uh, beginning historian, my goal was to get into the archives. I was studying what became a chapter in that book, A Revolution of the Mind, on the Institut Krasny Professuri in the 1920s. And a number of people whom I met that year, they weren't from ed higher education, but just Soviet people. When I told them I was from Yale University, uh, they would ask, это у вас главный университет? And I would say, or centralny universitet. And I would say, no, I mean, Yale is a pretty good university, but we actually don't have one single main university like yeah. MGU. Um, and I could see that maybe that somehow lowered me in some people's eyes. I came from the province of Connecticut in the, you know, the city of New Haven, and uh, it was sort of a regional center, perhaps. And I tried to explain that in the US there was no single center. Maybe Harvard was considered the most prestigious university, but Harvard was not central because in the US there were over 150 what we called research universities. But of course, the concept of research university didn't really exist. And I soon learned that in the field of history, of Russian history, the Institut Histori Akademi Nauk was much more prestigious and research oriented than, say, the history department at Moscow University. So this is actually going to be the central topic that I'm going to address today, which is the relationship between the Academy of Sciences and the universities in the Soviet system of higher learning. And when I say higher learning, I mean higher education and science together. That phrase combines the research component, scientific research, scholarly research in all fields and education. So for many years after that, 
I, uh, in fact, for over a decade, I studied the archives that were relevant to the topic that I'm going to um, talk about today, which is um, the genesis. I'm going to try to, in 45 minutes or so, cover the genesis of the, the Soviet system of higher learning, how it came into place and what it was. Uh, I started by studying um, the Communist Party institutions that were set up after 1917 to train a new uh, party intelligentsia. That was not just the Institut Krasny Profesuri, but uh, the Sverdlov Communist University, the system of communist universities in the early years were not only cadres, but were sort of communist alternatives to the old universities. And then also a much or higher research university, the Kommunistische Akademie, which originally in 1918 was called the Socialist Academy of Social Sciences, and then was renamed the Communist University, uh, Communist Academy. I then went on to study the so-called Bolshevization of the old Academy of Sciences, which happened in the late 1920s. This was a very fateful episode about which much was written here in Russia in the 1990s and late 80s, uh, which began with the forced election of communist academicians to the old Academy of Sciences. There had been no party members in the Academy before 1929, and this launched the transformation of the old Academy of Sciences. And then I went on to study the universities, which is one of the most important topics that I want to talk about today. There's, in, as, in opposition to the Academy of Sciences, which many people studied, the universities have been very little studied in the early years of Soviet power. And there's a, in particular, I'm going to concentrate on a very little known episode, which happened in the late 20s, early 30s, uh, where the universities were broken up into specialized research institutes, and some universities actually disappeared. And there was attack on the very idea of universities as feudal relics. And then finally, after sitting in those archives for many years, I took part in several sort of collaborative, collective attempts to generalize about what I had written and compare the Soviet system of higher education and science. Um, in particular, there was a book I took part in called Universities Under Dictatorships, which was a comparative work on universities in authoritarian regimes. There was, I think, more important than that for the purposes of what I'm talking about today. There was a book um, I edited, I co-edited with a Hungarian scholar who now works in Norway named Dürj Petri, who, uh, which was called Academia in Upheaval, the Origins and Demise of the Communist um, Academic Regime in Russia and East Central Europe. And then I would also mention, if you're interested in the topic that I'm going to talk about, um, there's a book uh, that came out here in Russian, uh, edited by Alexander Dmitriev, who works here in the Higher School of Economics and the History Department, um, which I took part in, which was about the, which was called Raspisania Pyramien Ochi. Ocherki pa istori obrazovatelne i naučni politiki v Rasijski imperiji i SSSR. So those are the, the background for what I'm going to talk about. Now let me begin with the situation before 1917, because I think that's very important to start with, because it's important context for what came after the revolution. And in Russia, of course, there was an academy before there was a, universe, a single universe, functioning university. The Academy of Sciences, as you know, was founded under Peter the Great uh, in 1724 as part of the Petrine uh, reforms. <clears throat> and it was uh, made up primarily of German scholars until uh, it was went this so-called process of Russification uh, only in the 1880s. 
But of course, Moscow University followed the academy in 1755, and a whole series of other major universities were founded in the early part of the 19th century under Alexander I. Before, there was a fully functioning system of secondary education. So the academy came first, then the universities, and then in the late 19th century, the lower levels of the educational system were uh, developed out in the great reforms. Of course, there was a schools, there were church schools and, and many other kinds, but what I'm talking about is you can see that there's um, a process by which science and higher education uh, were developed initially in the 18th century by and large from above, from the top down, and from abroad as part of the Europeanization of Russia after Peter the Great. And the academies and the universities were sponsored by the modernizing autocracy and run according to state charters. And I'm not telling you anything you don't already know, but with the great reforms of Alexander II under the, in the late 19th century, there were major changes in the nature and status of Russian universities. The reforms gave, <coughs> um, the great reforms, gave the universities a new charter granting them a significant degree of internal autonomy. There was also the rapid growth of professional societies and public organizations of all types. Um, the struggle for institutional autonomy that then commenced and lasted all the way down to 1917 set the stage directly for the early Soviet developments. And by the period after 1905, it led to the creation of the first non-state the first three might call them private, I guess, but they were really uh, non-state-run non institutions, the so-called people's universities, which uh, represented intelligentsia enlightenment initiatives formed by a coalition of the left. It also led to the famous standoff in 1911 between the Moscow Professoriate and the Minister of Education, Kasa, in which the cream of the academic intelligentsia, many um, resigned from Moscow University, many switching over to the Shanyavsky People's University. And when the universities were tightly subordinated to the state in the first Soviet era charter, Ustav of 1922, the rector of Moscow University likened the Bolshevik commissars of enlightenment, Lunacharsky and Pakrovsky, to the reactionary czarist ministers, Pabiedonotsov and Kasa. So what happened in late imperial period was that the universities flourished as research centers and taken together, they were certainly rivals to the Academy of Sciences. But for all their growth and development in that period, they were still highly fragmented institutions, both socially and politically. The professoriate was by and large liberal or moderate, although there were other trends. But, and it was caught between a radicalized student movement and the czarist administration. And the universities were divided politically among revolutionaries, moderates and liberals, conservatives. The complete closing of the universities in 1905, and there were standoffs and divisions after the failed revolution of 1905, only fragmented the uh, universities further. So what you have is a rather extraordinary half century of growth and development, but it was also combined with discord and uh, uh, struggles over internal autonomy. And so if you look at the period after 1917, which was also a struggle for the first half decade after 1917, between 1917 and 1922, there was a very strong struggle for university autonomy and what the Bolsheviks called the winning of the higher <coughs> school, which ended with the imposition of the new university charter of 1922. It makes good historical sense in, in light of what came before. So let me now turn to the divided academic order of the 1920s. <clears throat> so what you see after 1917 is a kind of division, quite remarkable, or kind of bifurcation between the old 
institutions, including the universities and the Academy of Sciences that had existed in Russia long before, and new institutions that were set up um, by the Communist Party and were considered also revolutionary innovations. So higher learning became very dualistic, and that mirrored the divisions of the Soviet party state. The Communist Party had its own institutions and the state had its own institutions, including the old educational institutions. Now let me give you a quote from the, um, the famous book the, by Bukharin and Preobrazhensky, written in 1919, the ABC of Communism, Azbuka Komunizma, which was a kind of textbook extremely widely popularized, uh, instantly transformed into a kind of uh, Soviet textbook in 1919. It treats higher education in openly dualistic terms, and I'm quoting about the future of higher education. At the present time, it is still impossible to foresee precisely what character the higher schools for the training of specialists will assume under communism. Nevertheless, the present universities have ceased to be serviceable institutions, and most of the students in the future will have to be proletarians. So that was the view that it wasn't clear what the fate of the old institutions would be. And then the, the book continues, Soviet party schools, Sovpartskole, represent a revolutionary alternative, a new type of school, which is intended to be serviceable to the revolution now in progress. So you have this immediate sense that the old universe institutions may not survive at all. That was in 1919, that was the period of war communism. But war communism was followed by NEP, the new economic policy. And the, in, under NEP, in fact, the old pre-revolutionary institutions were preserved and even protected. So what you have is, um, I talked about the old universities which were put under communist control with the new charter, but that was 1922, and that was the result of a lengthy struggle. But what all, all that meant was that there was a communist rector of the old universities, but the old professoriate largely remained and there was kind of a de facto stability that um, arose in the old universities. But that was after the result of a significant battle. With the Academy of Sciences, it was a rather different situation because the academicians immediately came to a kind of modus vivendi with the authority, the Soviet power, as early as 1918. In return for state support, the old academy agreed to cooperate on scientific projects that would be of importance to the state. And Lenin famously forbade, he, he said there should be no mischief making around Mishatlstva, around the old academy. And that, by, by that he meant that local communists and revolutionaries should not, should treat the academy as a kind of protected zone. And that was already in the early years after 1918. Under NEP, but the material conditions for scholars were still very harsh. Um, under NEP, they, they stabilized and material, especially for privileged scientists and approved members of the old intelligentsia, the conditions improved. For example, Ivan Pavlov, who had won the Nobel Prize and was a famous scientist, was seen, whose physiology was seen by Bukharin and others as compatible with Marxism, felt free to give openly anti-Bolshevik speeches at the beginning of his lectures, and yet he had a lot more material privileges in the 20s, and especially the 30s, uh, for his laboratory uh, than he had in the early years. NEP also brought about a relative stability for the old universities, as I mentioned, but only after they were um, brought under administrative control. So to com I talked about the old professoriate remaining largely in place with a number, of course there was an emigration, there were defections and so on, but 
the members, the professors who remained were overwhelmingly not members of the party. And the Studentschaftstra in the early years was also, in the very early 20s, was largely non-Bolshevik and contained sizable contingents of activists from other political parties, the Mensheviks, the SRs, the anarchists, who were driven underground in the 1920s. And this situation led the Bolsheviks to rely very heavily on the party cells within the higher educational institutions and on the militant communists who led them. And the party cells in the early 20s gained enormous political and even sometimes administrative control or power, as did to a lesser extent the new workers' faculties or Rabfake, which were designed to proletarianize the higher school. So in 1922, there were 64 Rabfake with 25,000 students. And so as a result of these changes, many communist student politicians came to view themselves on, as kind of leaders on the front lines of a class struggle to transform higher education. And um, they wanted to destroy the old institutions and the non-party personnel as much as they wanted to create anything new. So this became a kind of factor in the story that I'm going to tell. At the higher levels of the academic system in the 1920s, it was a period of great uh, institutional and disciplinary change and flux. Uh, so the years after 1917 led many to take advantage of state patronage to pursue their own agendas. There was, for example, a wave of new uh, scientific research institutes Naučni Sadovatelski Instituti, and there was a range of, in, of brand new disciplines, social medicine, for example, that took advantage of the new situation. And in return for political loyalty, for recognizing the new regime, many previous outsiders were empowered and pursued their own projects. Some of these projects were quite utopian in nature and are now being studied by historians of science. I'll just give you a couple of interesting examples. One has been studied um, by the historian of science Kirill uh, Rasianov, who works, I think, at the Institut Istorie Estetvoznani i Techniki here. Uh, the attempt to crossbreed humans with other with apes and anthropoid, spe anthropoid species carried out experiments carried out by the scientist Ilya Ivanov which lay at the beginnings of organized primate research in the Soviet Union. It remains one of the most unusual experiments ever done on non-human primates, attempt to, to cross-fertilize them with human beings. Another different example in the 20s is Lenin's old rival, uh, Alexander Bogdanov, who had been a leader of the left faction of the Bolsheviks and a founder of the so-called prolet cult in the early years then went into the Socialist Academy as a non-Bolshevik scholar. But he was able to create an institute of blood transfusion in early 1926 with funding from Narkomsdrav. And Bogdanov saw blood transfusions, you know, transferring blood into the human body as a revolutionary innovation that would, would um, prolong human life. You could get rid of aging, and it would be part of a kind of rejuvenation of the species. He eventually died as a result of an experiment he performed on himself. And this is the subject of a new book by the historian of science uh, and medicine, Nikolai Kremensov. So to sum it up, between, nine, so there were all these experiments and innovations and sometimes very odd projects that were uh, part of the, the, the revolutionary situation. Between 1922 and 28, to sum it up, there was a highly divided academic system of higher learning in which the new party institutions competed with the old pre-revolutionary institutions. And with the, within the old institutions, such as the universities, the situation was again fragmented. Many different groups and interests were competing, and the old academy remained 
highly privileged and protected. In 1926, the Old Academy celebrated with great fanfare its 200th Jubilee. And the question was, how long could it retain? Uh, it was given lavish state support. Foreign scientists were invited from around the world. But how long could it maintain its non-Marxist, non-Bolshevik corporate traditions? It turned out not for very long. Um, okay, and so it was both a time of change, but also enforced stability because the party forces and radicals from the younger generation were restrained and contained as long as the NEP system persisted. Um, now this is a good point to stop and ask about the authorities, the people who ran the system, who were mainly, I mentioned Lunacharsky and Pakrovsky, those were two very important people, but these were basically members of the Communist Party elite who, um, who were, take, took a deep uh, interest in administration uh, of science, education, and culture. Um, what were their goals? What were their models? In basic terms, it might seem like that is a very obvious question. The, they wanted the party administrative control. They wanted to create a new politically loyal set of cadres and a new intelligentsia. They wanted to promote the ideology, Marxism, Leninism. And they wanted, as I mentioned in the case of the Rob Focke, they wanted um, to proletarianize the higher school. They wanted to change the social composition. This was called vidvigenia of cadres, those of social, not just proletarian social origins, but communist party members with in good standing with political affiliations. All these things are very well known, and what I'd like to focus on are a few lesser known goals and models of these uh, figures. First, one thing I found was the idea of an academy had been present within the Bolshevik party from a very, the idea of a kind of a new type of academy of, sci of sciences. There was a, actually a very little known attempt in the emigration uh, in, the, in, in 1912, um, which, which was um, actually, this is uh, 1909 actually, uh, had a project for creating a new type of academy called the Russian Academy in Exile, which was both members of revolutionaries and members of the avant-garde. So there were interestingly some artists involved. And this was the left um, Bolshevik or period faction <coughs> of the Bolshevik party. For them, the idea of, the, of a new type of academy was attracted, attractive because it would be a kind of new <coughs> post-liberal organicist um, effort to overcome the division of labor. So it would be kind of some kind of single institution that would not be specialized or divided, but would create a new, a new center. Um, and it's interesting, a new kind of collectivist science. So it was uh, planning and collectivism were part of the vision from the early years. And the period faction was, was important because all the later administrators, including Lunacharsky, uh, were, came out of that group. Uh, and a lot of them were associated with the socialist, later communist academy after 1917, including Bogdanov. Um, um, Pavel Lebedev Polyansky later was involved. He later became the head of Glav Lit, um, and especially Pakrovsky, too, as well. Um, so in the 20s, these people actually did create their own academy, the, the socialist later Communist Academy. It was renamed in 1924. Uh, and they, what were the goals of the Communist Academy? Well, they were highly political. They openly dreamed of creating a new kind of hegemony in academia, centralizing power in their own hands and taking over the prestige and resources of the old Academy of Sciences. And this was a significant motivation 
behind the Bolshevization of the Academy of Sciences that occurred in 1929. When the communist academicians entered the old Academy of Sciences, they transferred their dreams of hegemony from the communist academy to the Academy of Sciences, which had been newly taken over, Bolshevized, and then was set on the course to become the single dominant empire of knowledge, as one historian called it, Alexander Vucinich, who wrote a book under that title called The Empire of Knowledge, about the history of the Academy of Sciences. Um, so in late imperial Russia, the academy had never been hegemonic in that way that it became uh, in the Soviet Union, the single dominant, most important, most prestigious <laughs> institution. Secondly, there was the idea of planning and science as it emerged out of total war in 1914. The German economy, the Kriegswirtschaft of the World War I period involved high degree of state interventionism. It was a, attractive for Bolshevik theoreticians like Bukharin. Um, and one reason the idea of a new academy was, in, was interesting to them was because in, in an academy, you could fit these new um, scientific research institutes. So after 1917, the idea of a scientific research institute was greatly <coughs> furthered, and the German, um, the German organization, the Kaiser Wilhelm Gesellschaft, which was an umbrella organization of scientific research institutes that, especially during World War I, were mobilized to serve the needs of the war economy during, in the German case, that was attractive, a kind of a foreign model for uh, the period after 1917. The Bolsheviks, of course, wanted to leap one step forward and not just have state involvement, but to nationalize the entire enterprise. But what was attractive especially was that these scientific research institutes would serve the needs of state mobilization. But these foreign models were not always acknowledged after 1917. The Scientific Research Institute could also be portrayed uh, as a product of the Russian Revolution. And this was, uh, uh, for example, in a report I found from 1922, which was from an, the main administration of scientific institutions, or Glav Nauka, um, stated that the Scientific Research Institute is entirely the child of the revolutionary era. Of 88 scientific research institutes in the RSFSR in 1925, 73 of them were founded after the revolution. So there was a kind of wave of institution building of scientific research institutes, and most of them were in the applied or natural sciences. So universities thus lost ground in Soviet expectations about the future, either through the rise of scientific research institutes or the idea of a new kind of academy of sciences. And in addition to that, the old universities could still be seen at, as unreconstructed or alien institutions. Um, there's another issue that I want to raise, which is the idea of vocationalism, of technical education, of planning, of serving practical needs, of linking higher education to production. All these things became incredibly important after 1917, and they were in competition with um, the promotion of the Marxist social sciences which still involved general education and the promotion of Marxism. So in the 20s, there were kind of these two competing strands, the kind of uh, technology productionist uh, strand and the, the, the social science Marxist strand. And there was, in the, these trends competed within the Russian Federation, the RSFSR, but in the Ukrainian case, there, the rad, a radical strand of vocationalism actually won out in the early 1920s and um, resulted in the breakup of four Ukrainian universities in 1921-22. Um, these were um, 
Kiev, Odessa, Kharkov, and Yekaterinoslav. And they were replaced by 42 different research institutes. So um, the greater disruption of, of education in Ukraine during the Civil War allowed for the Ukrainian Narkompros to push for a system that was much more oriented towards practical specialization after 1920. And the Ukrainian Main Committee on Professional Education, this was called Ukr Glavprav Obr, which was headed by this person, Jan uh, Petrovich Ryapa. He carried out the breakup of these four universities. And in the Russian Federation, the Narkompros, headed by Lunacharsky and Pakrovsky, managed to you know, keep those special, the, the push for specialized technical education as just one of many trends. But Ryapo called not for reform, but for revolution, including the breakup, the destruction of the old universities. He called them at this time temples of science. Temples is a religious term, whose professor priests trained only intelligentsia dilettantes. And so on, he was against even creation of an institute of red professors in the Ukraine, which was effectively blocked. So the reason I raise this Ukrainian example is because what happened in the Ukraine in 1920-22 bears a really uncanny resemblance to what happened in the Soviet Union as a whole in the years 1929-1930-31 the assault on the old universities and the breakup of some of them into specialized research institutes. And there's actually some evidence of connection between the two events. In fact, Ryapa, who, who was in Ukraine in the earlier episode, resurfaced in Moscow uh, in 1927 with ties to the Central Bureau of Proletarian Students. So let me now turn to the period 1928 to 1932, which is, of course, the first phase of the Stalin period, and witnesses two key institutional developments in the emergence of the Soviet system of higher learning. The one I've already mentioned, which is the Bolshe Bolshevization of the Academy of Sciences, which remarkably, the old academy was still in 1927 operating according to its old charter, which had been passed in 1836. The imposition of a new charter, Ustav, in 1927 was the first step in the uproar that occurred in 1929 with the election of uh, six communist academicians, members of the old communist academy, and three of them were initially rejected by the academicians in the Academy of Sciences. And as a result of that scandal, uh, there were arrests and or reorganizations, the so-called Akademitska Diela or Diela Platonova in 1930, when there was a purges of the institution. And throughout this period, it was not a foregone conclusion that the old academy would survive. It's worth quoting a secret uh, report by one party scientist um, the, uh, whose name was Yarilov, who referred to the academy as an archaic anachronism. He wanted to create a new center uniting the entire complex of scientific research institutions and organizations, an entire all-union collective of scientific workers as a whole. Half measures would be useless or else and I'm quoting here, Sanskritologists, astronomers, or mathematicians would be in charge of the old academy instead of economists, technician organizers, and politicians and planners. So that quotation, in a sense, gives you a good sense of what they, uh, they wanted to do with the Academy of Sciences. Um, but as I mentioned, when the party Bolsheviks from the Communist Academy rejoined the Academy of Sciences, they transferred this dream of a new scientific center to the Academy of Sciences. And therefore, 
The old communist academy in the 30s spiraled into a period of decline. Its buildings were actually taken over by the old Academy of Sciences in 1935. It was merged with the Academy of Sciences. And the capital of the old Academy of Sciences was moved from Leningrad to Moscow in 1934, taking up buildings that originally had been planned for the communist academy. So, it's now, this is kind of a, what happened with the Academy of Sciences, I perceive as a kind of merger between the two traditions of the Communist Academy and the old Academy of Sciences. Um, and it's so, the way that the old, the history of the Academy of Sciences is presented, even down to today, as kind of one unbroken tradition that stretched back to Peter the Great, the Great is in my view an oversimplification. It was a kind of synthesis, a symbiosis of, um, of two uh, academic traditions. Um, and the Communist Academy has rarely been recalled by people who write the history of the Academy of Sciences. Um, okay, so many of the, 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 what the Academy of Sciences launched on was a period of great expansion, creation of new scientific research institutes, expansion, centralization, fundamental reform in the humanities center uh, section, and a strong sense of service to the state. What did not, was not achieved in the old Academy of Sciences was applied science. They tried to introduce engineering, but it didn't really take, it remained a bastion of fundamental research. And, um, and I'm gonna get to this uh, theme pleasant, presently about, about applied research. Because I'm gonna get to that in a couple of minutes. But let me now turn to what happened with the old universities. There was a kind of assault that, um, started after the Shakti trial of 1928. Um, <clears throat> what happened in the late 1920s was at the very top levels of the party, Stalin and Molotov, a course was launched to rapidly train new cadres for the industrialization drive. This, uh, I mentioned Vrydvizhenia. And so um, higher education, there was a big push towards technical and applied training with so-called ties to production in the era of the first five-year plan. Lazar Kaganovich, who headed a Politburo Commission on Technical Cadres in 1929, made a speech where he talked about the forcible preparation of proletarian specialists as the most important task of the entire party. And he demanded more industrial practice, that meant new institutes with sharply expressed specialization. So very narrow technical specialization became uh, the primary trend of the first five-year plan. And at that same time, when higher technical uh, education with rapidly produced cadres with narrow specializations occurred, the universities as institutions came under attack. I'm going to quote to you from an article in 1929 in the journal Krasne Studienstvo called Are Universities Necessary? The writer, a certain Markov, called the universities a medieval fortress, a monstrous conglomerate, um, and idols of pure science, and called for the traditionally large multidisciplinary faculties, the facultiete, to be broken up into specialized institutes. That was in 1929, and what happened in 1930 was exactly that same process. The height of the attack on the universities was reached in 1930. Um, uh, the, they um, were broken up into, um, and transferred into often technical institutes under the aegis of the industrial commissariats, or the medical faculties were broken up into medical institutes and transferred to the Commissariat of Health and so on and so forth. And um, this process escalated in 1930. And so, in fact, you, in the 1920s, you had two Moscow universities. You had the first MGU and the second. The second MGU uh, completely disappeared as a result of these um, 
transfers. Some of the universities, the oldest ones in the biggest cities, survived, but others did not. And um, you know, so Leningrad, Moscow, Kazan, you know, held on to more departments. But there was an economic dimension to this struggle because when the institutes were taken away, the the uh, laboratories, the property, the, the the furniture, the equipment, that was all transferred from the universities to these new institutes which were under the commissariats. And so there was, in the Soviet system, not just the ac Academy of Sciences sector, which was fundamental science, fundamental research, but there's this whole new sector that arose of applied research, so-called branch science or Atraslovaya Nauka, which existed under the commissariats and was highly kind of practically applied oriented. And then the old universities, which um, then were survived this period of attack. After 1932, they, they managed to become sort of rehabilitated and the course of the 1930s managed to strengthen their position. But they were sort of downgraded within the system to primarily teaching institutions. Now that changed over the course of the later Soviet decades, especially at places like Moscow universities, which reacquired a strong research function, but perhaps not so much in, um, in the provincial universities. Um, and of course, um, Moscow University, because of its central location, was a special case. But I want to just basically um, finish here by, I, I want to conclude by pointing to looking forward from the formation, the genesis of the Soviet system. I, I've pointed to three major processes. First, the old universities and the idea of universities as research institutions was greatly weakened in the early Soviet period and especially around 1930. Secondly, the number of specialized technical applied institutes or branch institutes, Atraslavia Institute, they shot up in this period and that was the birth of that whole sector which never found a home in the Academy of Sciences. And then finally, I've talked about the newly Bolshevized Academy of Sciences which was set on a path towards expansion and domination of the entire system of, of advanced fundamental research. Now, um, I'm going to mention a few long-term consequences. Uh, if people here have other ideas about the legacy of the Soviet system, um, I would be interested in hearing them because historians of higher education generally have not studied uh, the late Soviet period on the basis of archival documents. Um, but from my perspective, just speaking in very general terms and without especially profound empirical knowledge, what I see is that in the Soviet system, the episode of the 20s and 30s, the, the assault on the old universities, greatly weakened universities over the long term. Um, exceptions were made for the most important universities, such as Moscow University. But in the whole, especially when you compare to what happened in the later part of the 19th century, universities, the university sector did not achieve the potential that it began to have in the late 19th century. And the corollary to that weakening of the universities was that especially provincial universities were weakened. They were in line with the um, centralizing tendencies of Soviet science and culture. There were many important uh, universities throughout the Russian Empire in the 19th century, but in the Soviet system, the provincial institutions were weakened compared to the central ones. There's an economic, little studied economic dimension for that. That would be a good subject for a future dissertation. Budgets, finances, the material base of those um, institutions of higher education. And 
one sign of the downgrading of the universities and the higher educational institutions in general were very high teaching loads, which prevented much research from being carried out by the faculty members at higher schools. And despite the fact that the Academy of Sciences in post-Soviet Russia is no longer dominant the way it was in the Soviet Union, and despite the fact that the universities and higher educational institutions have experienced a revival and development, such as here at the Higher School of Economics, my impression is that the teaching loads, the requirements, are still remain far more onerous than they are in many countries with research universities. So I will stop there, having spoken a little too long, and I'll be glad to try to answer your questions and hear your comments. I think they, re they regained, it was different in different places. Um, but they also became very specialized in the, even when they continued to exist in the 1930s. So the, the, the whole system was permeated by high degree of specialization. The um, historian, and this was true inside the old university. So it became, a kind of institutional vehicle which combined highly specialized faculties. Um, and it, it survived as um, a kind of institutional form, but I'm not so sure that the content was so very different, at least in the early 30s and mid 30s, than it was in the new institutes. And for example, the historian of science, uh, Lauren Graham, who's a leading historian of science, wrote about um, engineering disciplines. They were, because he had himself an engineering training, they were so specialized that they focused on specific parts of specific machines, that you could become an engineer for a certain type of cog in a certain type of machine. It was, in order to, you know, this was an extreme example, but I think that. Um, they, the, what happened was, was a question of political power, that at some point around 1930, 31, 32, the, um, there were the, the, the forces uh, who were protecting the universities succeeded in defending them, and they just continued. But later on, I think you're right, that their function became different. They were more, they, they were sort of, a more prestigious part of the hierarchy of higher educational institutes. So they acquired a greater prestige and they probably had a greater degree of general education than the Vuzi. Would you agree with that? that that's an interesting <coughs> point. Uh, in fact, <coughs> I guess it would be worthwhile to look at the, uh, this segmentation within the institutions. Indeed, just while you were talking, I thought about Fakultet Pachvaledinia uh, in Moscow State University, how it could, when it uh, was organized, for example, yes. maybe at the same time as you called it, uh, Otras Lirava. Yeah, yes. Well, you know, I think the, the, the universities remain, you know, I, it's interesting because I found a document around 1930, they started planning for the reconstruction of Moscow the plans for the new socialist city. They were already planning for a new building 
for Moscow University, which was only built in the late 40s. But the idea of having a university was in part for foreign consumption. One reason when they built the huge building on Vinsky Gore was that it would be foreign visitors would be impressed by how important universities were. So partly universities existed internationally and it was impossible to destroy them as institutions. But it seems to me that the idea of a, res you know, there's this Humboldtian idea of the university as a centers of both teaching and research and also this, the idea of a, of a university that would be bigger than the sum of its parts, that would gain something from general education. Those ideas were greatly weakened in the Soviet period. Thank you. By the way, just a brief comment. When we did some analysis of this structure, institutional landscape, our hypothesis was that um, this Universities, classic. In fact, we don't have a good name for them. Classical universities. Yes. And they also their special function was to train local political uh -huh. elite because they had uh, faculty of law, journalism, yes. uh, those sectors that were highly controlled by the party. But the second question: When uh, one of the peculiarities of the Soviet system was. Uh, the uh, many different ministries or narcomats controlled yes. universities. It, uh, it, it was not completely new because even pre-revolutionary WITA organized uh, yes. all the technical universities, right. uh, the Minister of Finance uh, yes. in Tsar's time. But in Soviet times uh, it, it happened, it, it was normal. Uh, to be part of the sector of ministers. How it started? When uh, could you tell hmm. a little about that? That is part of the episode that I'm describing, I think. I mean, uh, because in the 1920s, it was, they, they were completely under the control of Narkompros. And what happened at the Narkompros and Lunacharsky were very closely associated with NEP. And what happened in 1929 was that all the, co the leading Bolshevik administrators who were, had been associated with NEP were removed from their posts either in 1929 or in 1930. And as a part of this breakup of the universities, first of all, um, the commissariats gained control over higher technical education, which was a huge win in this first five-year plan period. The only thing that remained in Narcompros was the uh, pedagogical institution, institutes because they trained teachers and Narcompros was associated with education. So Narcompros was greatly weakened at the end of the 1920s and the commissariats were greatly strengthened. But in general, there was always a degree of bureaucratic overlap just because of the structures of the party state. There was the party institutions and then there were the state institutions and there was all sorts of kind of, um, kind of overlapping functions as a result of that. And so I think perhaps that's not at all surprising. Uh, in, before 1917, I mean, you raise a in very interesting issue, which as you know, my colleague Harley Balzer has written about higher technical education under Vita in the 1890s because the Ministry of Finance was very interested in, um, in producing well-qualified specialists. And Vita introduced a kind of more modern system which was financed in part with private financing. So there was a kind of state-private cooperation going on under Vita. And I think that's also very typical. Uh, it's also, there's something typical there for the Soviet period as well. The Soviet period was much more centralized, but there were still these different periods of reform and crackdown and different interests that were competing within each period. So, for example, um, even during the first five-year plan, when there's an assault on the old institutions, 
there's a kind of internal opposition that's waiting for the change in 1932 to occur. And they take advantage of the change in 1932. Or during the thaw and the switch to the Brezhnev period, there are all these alternations and some groups come out on top and other groups um, get pushed under. And I would say that's not even so um, unusual for our own times. And so they have their own institutional agendas that can get pushed down at a certain time, but they're later waiting around to be revived when the political situation changes later. So. It's, it's very interesting. In fact, this gives us, uh, gives us an insight that we underestimate party structure that control higher education. We usually don't take it in our equations when we discuss governance of higher education. And we look at that, that is very fragmented, but there was a Отдел высших учебных заведений, right, mm -hmm. in the Central Committee of the Communist Party, and it probably played an important role. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Many more? <coughs> yes. Uh, <coughs> I have a question about academies. So, in some sense, academies are not independent because they heavily dependent on our universities, on young generations, right? Yes. So they didn't train any 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 people themselves. How how is there all of their coordination mechanism in terms of like uh, obligatory assignments of people from institutions to academies and how you're, you're talking program? about the Academy of Sciences yeah. of the Soviet Union. Yeah. Well they did train graduate students though. Yeah, really, but not like undergrads right. basic training. So what was the relationship you're asking between that? Um, well, um, I mean, I think, you know, maybe Oleg knows about the Institute of History, but my impression is that, um, you know, these, these remain the top echelon of the um, academic system. And they drew on, they could draw on the, the, the people they wanted from various places, including universities. But they, the people who finished the graduate training within the academy had a better chance of staying within the academy. But I don't really know of any kind of specialized research on how many, for example, um, in the decades of the Soviet period, you know, were, um, came from within the academy. What I do know in the literature on the Academy of Sciences, for example, there's a book, um, interesting book called Stalinist Science by Nikolai Kremensov, was that the academy still retained, it, it was greatly brought under political control, but the academicians still retained a degree of autonomy over their own affairs, which was quite surprising even in the Stalin period. So they sometimes had to change the name of their research. They couldn't um, um, study genetics anymore, but they just changed the names, but continued to carry out the same research. So I suspect that in terms of the training of cadres, they still retained a good, a good deal of autonomy, but more specifically, I'm not sure I can say. I just wonder at what moment's idea of academic breeding are in part of well, I think that these institutes within the Academy of Sciences are very unusual in an international perspective because you have a discipline and you have the leading people on, uh, in the country within this one institute, which can be very productive. There was a lot of success in the Soviet science system, but there's a, a very strong person in charge, so the, the, the tradition of a strong single figure, and that can, and then, and having no competition, no kind of um, uh, ability to move away from what that one leader wants to do, also creates distortions and weaknesses. So there were advantages of this highly centralized system of gathering everyone in one place, but there were also weaknesses. and. Um, I think that you know there was a kind of very hierarchical system that was put in place in these within these, uh, and this was true not only of the party uh, 
members, but for example, Ivan Pavlov, who had his own institute, was a very authoritarian figure within his own, there's a new biography of Pavlov, by the way, huge volume. And you know, he, so he say, ruled things with an iron fist. And so you have this um, sort of Yedina Natshastra, you know, this Yedina is how Yedina Litsha, whatever they call it, you know, it's a single, single, and this mirrors the political system, of course. And so I think that um, that's a good question on how much inbreeding there was, but I suspect that there was a rather high degree. But that would be a good topic for, for special research. professoriate um, in the late imperial period there was a social shift I mean uh, there, uh, there was a lot of social history written about this but in general the de there was a decline of the nobility and rise of other sort of middle groups in the middle of society that was important in institutions of higher education in the state and even in the military so this was the last 50 years before 1917, there was a, but the, the ethos of the old professoriate, as there were differences, but it was largely, um, largely liberal. I mean, there was a, a reason why all the members of the Central Committee of the Constitutional Democratic Party were, I think, professors, is that right? Many of them were. Um, and of course, this led to a great emigration during the Civil War period. And there was a whole wave of intelligentsia emigres that left. And those who remained were, um, were quite um, uh, ill-disposed towards uh, the Bolshevik party. So unlike the Academy of Sciences, the professoriate waged this struggle which ended in 1922. So what you have in the 1920s is the explicit attempt to make a new kind of professor that's where the Institut Krasny Professuri came in, which was a kind of graduate training institution. But in the event, it trained more kind of party Marxist ska, uh, kind of ideologists and political figures than professors, in fact. And there were even some mixed institutions, like Ranion, which was uh, an, um, a social science, which was made up of older cadres and new younger generation. But in general, there was a kind of um, attempt to change the social composition of the new teachers of the higher school. And there was a great also generational conflict. It's not just social, but generational. And this generational conflict comes to a head in the late 20s, early 30s. Now, what I, I suspect that what happens after 1932, well, what happens after really that the, the, there's a speech that Stalin rehabilitates the old, what he calls the specialists of the old school, people who had retained their, gotten their education before 1917. So the attacks on them began to stop, and, but their numbers were much smaller, but they then managed to train a new generation. They may have been of different social origin, but they managed to a great degree the people who remained to inculcate a, um, a, a kind of ethos which was very much part of the kind of academic intelligentsia, non-party academic intelligentsia. The red professors of the 1920s generation, people are like, um, like Mintz, Isaac Mintz or Pankratova, or, you know, they became the party, they, they stayed in as kind of communist party militants with their own institutions. So there was a real generational division, but some of the old professors, 
managed to um, um, play a great role in training a new generation. So I wouldn't see the tradition, the academic traditions, as being entirely destroyed. There was a way in which the old academic intelligentsia managed to reproduce itself. But these are issues that are not very much studied. It's an excellent question. Was it a part of the government policy to, uh, to, uh, to make some kind of uh, territorial sets of institutions at this point, or it was the uh, it was more the uh, result of the uh, later periods? I mean, uh, you you, uh, you said about this uh, uh, branch institutions yeah. very narrow uh, and this. Uh, so for classical universities or old and new uh, universities, but uh, there was a set of institutions uh, that were tied with the particular, uh, uh, not with the particular industries uh, within the well uh, in, in industrial core of the of the economy, but more like uh, socially oriented, for example medical institutions or agricultural yes uh, uh, were they uh, did the government have special rationales uh, on establishing these universities in different ter territories of the country? I mean like the Union Republics and so forth uh, yeah and uh, I guess within the earth of Passar as well uh -huh. because it's the, the, the biggest part of the Union yeah um, well, I mean, they definitely, you know, in agricultural regions, they were they were trying to develop, you know, um, all the disciplines um, like veterinarians and so forth that were important in the local economy. So that was clear. But I think these eventually reverted within the the the, the, the Soviet system. The Union republics all had their own. Um, academies of sciences, they all had their own educational systems, so there was a degree of cultural ling and scientific educational linguistic autonomy built into the um, s federal structure of the Soviet state. The exception was the Russian Federation, which, because you know, there was only one Academy of Sciences for the whole Soviet Union. So in the center, um, it was, um, you know, the, 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 the all Union Soviet authorities and the um, Russian Republic authorities overlapped. And one scholar has compared this to a communal apartment where the different Union Republics have their own individual rooms, but the hallway, the kitchen, the bathroom, they're all taken up by the Soviet space, you know. And so um, how this worked in practice, I know about the 20s and 30s, but I'm not quite sure how it played out in the later years. But I, I think that the, um, the Soviet all-union organs definitely took precedence. And this was a highly specialized, uh, centralized system. So in, you know, the decisions were all taken um, at a high level in Moscow for, they, there was, the, the degree of local autonomy was highly curtailed. We have time for the last question. Uh, actually, I have another question. Yes. Well, uh, <coughs> thank you very much for your presentation. It was really interesting, but uh, uh, thank you. I'm sure that the people who are studying uh, Russian education and uh, research system are well aware of this historical divide between uh, teaching and research. And uh, my question is, however, not so much historical. What do you think? Uh, what we should do now? <laughs> of course, institutional reports are always very. It's a very complex thing, but maybe just you know, 
few basic steps <laughs> which are most important to take. Well, you see, I, at the end I tried to refer to this a uh, little perhaps not directly enough, but it seems to me that if you're going to have a research university, then you have to uh, reduce the amount of, of other burdens that are not research on the people who are carrying out the research. So when I look around at the higher school of economics, you know, where I have had some experience, the people who are hired from foreign countries have much less of a teaching load than the people who come from within Russia. That's because they have to compete internationally to recruit these people. But the, the teaching loads <coughs> remain a big problem. There's just more teaching uh, done here than at re certainly at research universities in the US. Now there, is, there are other countries where the loads are very high. But it seems to me that that's an issue that has, doesn't get discussed as much as it might be. But it also has an economic dimension because these are, the teaching fulfills a function within these institutions. So how as a practical matter without many more greater resources one could actually do that, achieve that, I don't know. But I certainly think um, that that's a big a big issue for discussion. Thank you. <laughs> I want to hear Alieg's comment, though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> неизвестно от какой аудитории, которая не занимается специальной историей, да? что вообще далее на протяжении только 20 е годы дальше развитие и изменения какие-то высшего образования были очень тесно связаны с общей политикой и с изменением в идеологии. А, например, в начале 30-х годов, даже в конце 20-х, стало окончательно ясно, что идея мировой революции рухнула. Как это связано с высшим образованием? Очень просто. Социализм будет построен в одной отдельно взятой стране, которая имеет границы, историю, которую необходимо защищать, воспитывать патриотизм и прочее. Что мы видим? Восстановление истории как предмета. Ее ведь не было, она была отменена, ликвидирована. Было общество знаний. 1934 год. Постановление о преподавании гражданской истории в школах СССР и о воссоздании исторических факультетов в университетах и педагогических и вот эти красные профессора, они были не в состоянии написать нормальную историю России. Поэтому люди, только что арестованные, отправленные в ссылки, Тарле э, там, и, и другие, они возвращаются, назначаются в университеты, в Академию наук. Тарле, которого исключили из академиков, э, это удивительная история, он вернулся, получил заказ на биографию Наполеона, видимо, лично от Сталина через, так сказать, посредников, а потом, значит, какие-то идиоты опубликовали отрицательную лицензию на Наполеона Тарль Люси, что же это такая всякая книга, и все было бы ничего, лицензия вышла в правде известия 12 июня 1937 года. Это мало что говорить, да? 11 июня 1937 года был процесс Пухачевского и других которые были приняты к расстрелу, Пухачевского назвали Красным Наполеоном. Вы понимаете, что бывает, когда 11 июня Красного Наполеона придавали в книгу, а 12 июня появляется отрицательная лицензия, разгромная на книгу Тарли Наполеон. И у него замолчали телефоны, он стал собирать вещи. На следующий день появляются одновременно в правде известия тексты такие, что вчера была опубликована ошибочная лицензия, в правде ошибочная, значит, да, на книгу Тарли Наполеон. Потому что там подходили к нему как марксист. Он не марксист, он еще буржуазный ученый. Но книга его рамка буржуазной науки вполне приличная. Но только один человек в стране мог сказать, что это правда, но это была неправильная лицензия. Да? И значит, пакет, который был адресован Тарли, вот этот же день, там, с чем-то там, он был написан Академику Тарли. Погодение ну, науки тоже не обсуждалось. Включали его, не включали, он стал академиком без обсуждения опять. Э, вот что, что происходило, да? И э, вот э, возвращение. И что, когда нет 
нет нормальных книг по истории, что происходит? В 37 году, именно в 37 году, передает курс русской истории Ключевского в пяти томах. Передает Преснякова, покойного, дореволюционного, так сказать, историка, история э, все-таки из Харуси в двух томах. Передает Платонова, умершего в ссылке. В 37 году выходит очерк и смуты в Московском государстве. Это феноменальная совершенно история, которая показывает, как все происходит. В июле 1937 года страна отмечала юбилей. Чего бы вы думали? Все, все подумали про Пушкина. Ледового побоища. Было, значит, там сколько-то там лет. Ну, Ледового побоища было в 1242 году. Я не силен в математике. Значит, было более там не очень круглый юбилей Ледового побоища. Была статья в правде об этом. Там было о чем угодно, кроме одной имя там не упоминалось. Александр Нилов. Почему? Потому что Александр Невский, молодой, что там князь, это флотатор, он еще и святой русской православной церкви. И на эту тему была масса иронических статей в Иранской печати, особенно в Георгия Федотова, замечательная статья, Александр Невский Карл Марса назвал. Вот. В следующем году выходит что? На экраны фильм Александр Невский. Это политическая линия и историческая наука, если к этому поворачивается. Это я могу долго говорить на эту тему, но не несколько штрихов. Второе, то, что связано с Академией наук и с вот, централизованными институтами и так далее. Война. Война, которая показала, что и выигрывает тот, у кого наука. И если я не ошибаюсь, думаю, что не ошибаюсь, будущий академик Флеров физик, который оказался где там на фронте, пошел, зачем они физики и теоретики нужны, когда война, да? Он каким-то образом умудряется получать информацию о публикациях в зарубежных журналах, они продолжали в не выходить. Обратил внимание, что там перестали публиковаться работы по делению атомного ядра. И он предположил, что в ряде стран работают на создание ядерного оружия. Ну, эти идеи как бы на этом начали что-то такое думать, и с 43 -го года начались какие-то размышления. Но когда американцы испытали атомную бомбу, потом ее бросили, стало совершенно понятно, что происходит. И тогда создаются вот эти вот централизованные всякие такие вещи. И, как мы знаем, что угодно подвергалось там, разгромам, генетика, там, кибернетика, но не физика. Поскольку когда какие-то лихие ребята пришли к Берегу или к Берегу проекта и сказали, вы знаете, там у них идеализм и так далее, он значит, вызвал Курчатова, сказал, ну, там физики идеализм, что будем делать? На что Курчатова сказал, ну, Эйнштейн, конечно, идеалист, но бомбу мы тогда не сделаем. После чего... Ситуация не сколько поменялась. А Ландау зачем посадили тогда? А, а Ландау тогда работал? Ландау посадили в 40 году. Значит, и он таки действительно был в группе, которая на советской выступке выпускала. Так что были реальные люди, которые что-то такое делали. И за Ландау вступился лично Капица, писал Сталину, в 40 году его выпустили. А так что это было до значит, вот этих вот вещей. И э, вот тогда я говорю, что и после войны Колоссально возрастает финансирование академических наук. Опять-таки были приняты решения, когда значит, там зарплаты сотрудников Академии наук колоссально выросли, ну и так далее и тому подобное. Ну такая была история, это немножко спрямляет, да, там были разные такие вещи, но это очень тесно связано с конкретными ситуациями, политическими, идеологическими, военными и так далее. И образование и наука, они рассматривали собой прагматически всегда, и вот так это собственно, происходило, ну, мои точки зрения, как раз главный рыв в плане образования, это послевоенный период, это вот, особенно десятилетия 45 по 55 когда просто произошли такие довольно серьезные изменения. Вот, ну, тема чрезвычайно увлекательная, конечно. Ну, я прошу прощения, да. но а, из, из Накеи, из Пекараши, mm -hmm. но я бы все-таки вам виднее, конечно, историкам, но а, как раз мы работали, в том числе и с э, э, вот, э, с материалами э, с книжкой, как она называлась, э, в которой ваши главы были опубликованы про историю российских университетов. Но мы сделали простую вещь, понимаете, безусловно, вы правы, там были всякие флуктуации, они очень интересные. Но мне кажется, что вот эти тренды, которые в вашей работе были, собственно, зафиксированы, но они назывались в политике отраслированием и втузированием, да. они в значительной степени в конце 30-х годов 
зафиксировались и сформировали. То есть я могу как раз, еще раз говорю, вам виднее, конечно, но когда мы смотрим на некоторые просто индикаторы, то мы обнаруживаем такую странную историю. Мы обнаружим, что общее количество университета, вот после всех этих делений и объединений, с 1939 -го года до конца советской власти, до 1991-го в Российской Федерации, не из изменилось очень мало. То есть, когда это увидели, мы были очень удивлены, потому что мы знаем про создание Фистеха и ФИ, мы знаем про переводы университетов, про разделение университетов при Хрущеве, но оказывается, что по отношению к основной массе университетов это уже были косметические, uh -huh. статистически незначительные изменения, а основная группа 90% университетов структурно была зафиксирована в конце 30-х годов как результат вот этих проектов. Может быть, я скажу там тогда конечное слово. Но мне кажется, что вот вы правы в том, что структуры советской системы в целом как-то сформировались именно в этой первой пятилетке. Это коллективизация сельского хозяйства, это плановая экономика, и в том числе то есть в области культуры и науки, в принципе, то же самое. То есть как Историки мы можем как-то разделить некоторые этапы. Структуры системы – это один момент. Потом есть конъюнктуры, очень важные события, войны, война, там, изменения, эволюция системы. Но эти самые структуры существовали до конца Советского Союза. То есть я в этом согласен с вами. Нет, это просто разные уровни вот, исторического процесса, скажем так. Так как мы все согласны, тогда можно уже заканчивать.